Hello, um, my name is Russell. I'm a software engineer at this place called Oxen. Uh, my background is in Clojure. I've been doing some systems level embedded Rust recently. And uh, over the past year or so, I've been introduced to a world that's new to me, um, the world of embedded safety critical systems. This is a world that is run for the most part by uh, electrical engineers. I'd like to start by sharing with you guys a little bit about how they approach the problem of making a system that is safe. You can think of the word safe as meaning it meets its requirements. It's just that the requirement, instead of being that uh, the movie gets delivered at the right time and when the user asks for it, it's that the user stays alive. The first thing they do is they decide on some safety requirements. This is just like a normal requirement. They go through uh, a more rigorous process to come up with it, but they say this is the top level requirement the system must meet so that, uh, so that our users don't die. Then they're going to take each of those safety requirements and say how much does this matter? It may be in terms of magnitude, how many people will die, Actually, yes that's a real thing, uh, or in terms of exposure, how, uh, how often do we expect the, uh, the associated circumstance uh, to occur. Maybe, it's, uh, maybe you can only get into that situation 1% of time in terms of uh, the operation of the system. Uh, so you'll uh, assign the, what they call the safety integrity level based on that. With that in hand, they'll pick apart their system design and figure out which parts of the system could contribute to uh, violating the safety requirement in question. You do this by forming a tree and saying if this faults, then I'll cause a fault up here and so on. That's called a fault tree. And then they say, based on this analysis, have I met uh, the, the requirements laid out and whatever standards they're looking at for the, uh, the safety integrity level that they uh, decided upon? If it's not good enough, then they'll, maybe they'll buy a more expensive part. Maybe they'll add some kind of redundant, uh, redundant system to it. Um, a somewhat contrived example here. Uh, suppose you have a huge industrial press, and this thing is going to have an emergency stop button. Our safety requirement, that thing sure as heck better work. The safety integrity level, this is uh, in most of the standards uh, on, a, in, on the scale from one to four, four being the most severe. In this case, we'll pretend it's four because it's definitely going to kill someone. But suppose when you take this uh, system apart, there may, maybe there's the button and there's the wires going to the actuator and a little control system to make the actuators go when the button is pushed. And maybe, speculating here, the actuator, based on the, uh, the data sheets from the supplier, you see that its failure rate makes it only sufficient for safety integrity level three. Well, we have to add some kind of redundancy. So we'll use two and we'll design a very, uh, very reliable failover mechanism and then meet our requirements for safety integrity level four. Um, this way of designing very safe systems is called functional safety. There's a series of standards that prescribe how to do this process. They lay out how you do the requirements, how you do the decomposition, um, and so on. And they're used in lots of places where human life is at stake. And this works pretty well, as witnessed by the fact that none of us died by, while getting here and interacting with lots of these different systems. Uh, but as usual, when time enters the picture, things get awkward. Electrical engineers, of course, have been dealing with time and clocks for quite a long time, and they're very good at it. You can buy a, uh, a, a clock, you can design a clock as part of your uh, your electronic system and you can characterize its reliability, you know how much it drifts based on temperature and so on. But things get more complicated when you have more clocks. Maybe you're, you're gluing together many small embedded systems as more people do nowadays and you need them to be the same. This is a, uh, a common way of thinking if you're coming at it from the perspective of an electrical engineer. And things get even more weird when you have programs running on all those little computers that are connected to each other and all assuming that they have the same clock. This seems a little bit absurd, I'm sure, to many of us in the room, where we would, coming from uh, the distributed system ba systems background, this is kind of the cardinal rule, is you don't do this kind of thing. 
But from the perspective of an embedded systems engineer, they're really good at designing reliable hardware systems. And this is a reasonable thing for them to do. But when it hits the software boundary, the failures that, are, that they're accustomed to don't really work the same way. The expectation is generally that when one part of the system fails, it's going to be localized. We know that in software, that just isn't the case. So I'm going to tell you a short story about a system like this. It has lots of computers, has some sensors and some actuators, and there's lots of different clocks. The designers of the system want there to be one clock, and they've designed it assuming that's the case. Uh, this was a client project for a company that I really sadly cannot name. Um, but the design of the system relies in a deep way on the idea that every node in the system has a very precise and exact notion of what time it is and that they all agree on that. When we encountered this design the first time, um, my, uh, my heuristic alarm started going off saying, there's, there's got to be something wrong with this. Anything that depends so deeply on the clock being the same everywhere is going to have problems when it drifts. You know it's going to drift. This is something that they already were aware of. They were assuming that the uh, impact would be low. So my goal here was to root out this problem and demonstrate it to them in a, in a very concrete way. I started in on this um, in perhaps the naive way, which is to say, all right, we've got a clock at each node. We have nodes A, B, and C here, and I'm just going to model the clock at each of them and figure out a way to impose drift and see what happens when I uh, model their, their systems algorithm on top of that. Um, here, system is meant to be abstract. Of course, we'll initialize all the clocks to zero. The system will be doing whatever the system does, and then how can we get to the next state? Well, we can tick one of the node clocks, or we can set the system. And uh, finally, we can run the clock sync algorithm. There are different ways to keep clocks in sync. Um, people that are designing systems like this will buy a very expensive one um, and analyze it as electrical engineers and say it's very reliable, it meets my specs. And of course, the system step and the, the, uh, the clock sync algorithm here are, uh, we'll, we'll pretend they're abstract for the moment. This isn't all that good of an approach, it turns out. Um, it would lead to an incredibly massive state explosion. Uh, as, as the clocks vary from each other, th this, this model allows one clock, for example, to tick once, and then another clock to tick forward 100 times. There are, uh, there are combinatorial problems with it. But perhaps more importantly than the fact that we could never model check this is that this isn't the important part of it. They don't care about the sync protocol. What they care about is the impact that some failures in this uh, clock synchronization system has on their machine. So what we really needed to be doing was modeling the drift itself, not the clock sync system. The approach we took to this was to add two parameters to the model. One is we bounded the total simulation time with a simulated cycles parameter here. And second, we bounded the clock drift that, were, that we were willing to simulate. This is a key, uh, this, this is an important question to our customer in this case, is how much clock drift can the uh, algorithmic part of the system tolerate? On the simulation side, we continue to have uh, one clock at every node and some abstract system state, but we also have a pretend global clock. There is, of course, no such thing as a real time, and there's not a global clock in the system, but it's a useful abstraction in the modeling context here, and also a useful way to communicate the results of this uh, to the customer. We have their three nodes, A, B, and C, as before, and we initialize all the clocks plus the fake global clock to zero. Ways of stepping the system. Well, we can step the clock, or we can step the system. And system step is abstract. We'll just pretend that that's doing whatever the system's doing. When we step the clock, 
either we will step the global, the global clock forward one, node clocks aren't changing, and then check the thing we'll get to next, or we'll step one of the node clocks. And the important part here, and the thing that makes this kind of tick, is this clock drift in bounds predicate, where we're artificially restricting the search space to the part that our customer cares about, um, which is just keeping the, uh, all of the node clocks which within the designated bounds of the global clock. Uh, so if we say that we're modeling up to two ticks of clock drift and the global clock is at 10, then this will allow the uh, node clocks to be up to 12 or as low as 8. This worked much better for us. Um, that clock drift in bounds relation uh, narrows the state space to only the parts that we care to consider, namely the parts that the, uh, the customer is uh, specifying that the system should operate under. And it directly addresses the, uh, the drift, which is what they care about. Turns out we were right. Um, while they assumed that any uh, out-of-bounds drift would lead to local failure, which they had accommodated for with redundancies and other, part of other parts of the system, it turns out that a combination of drift in particular places would lead to a system split brain and things would go down fast, downhill fast. When we delivered this model to them, um, we did it in a couple of parts. Um, one is we rendered out a nice PDF with, uh, with the, just the, the normal one that TLI Plus produces with copious comments describing what the model is, how it worked, uh, to the extent that it was basically a literate program. We also delivered to them a make file that they could use to run uh, a TLC against the model themselves and a config file to allow them to tune the parameters and a manual saying how to do it. Um, this downloaded the TLA tools jar just as part of the make file. Um, so it was a really minimal interaction service with them. What they cared about was uh, understanding what the model meant and how to configure it. Uh, TLA Plus is not really set up to work this way. It wants to be used, of course, in the IDE, um, but we found it to be well worth the time in this kind of case. I highly recommend giving executable models to your customers. They were extremely happy with this. Um, it allowed them to communicate with each other very explicitly about this class of failures in their system that they suspected might exist but was suddenly concrete. And it allowed them to experiment with different system configurations to, uh, to, to uh, refine their design to be more resilient to it. What I showed you is a fairly naive version of this. Um, it could be extended in a number of ways. One would be to model drift in an asymmetric way. Uh, different clocks are in different environments and thus subject to drift in a different, uh, to, to uh, higher or lower degrees. Uh, for example, a clock that is next to an industrial furnace will probably drift more than a clock that is in a cool data center. Um, there are systems, embedded systems especially, where you can consider the clock tick and some action the system is taking to be atomic when the action is driven uh, directly off the timer interrupt, for example. And you saw that I had to uh, put an artificial upper bound on this to keep the simulation finite. Um, I think depending on the system, you may be able to make the clock cyclical um, uh, to, to keep the entire state space finite. So, in closing, if you have a system that depends on clocks being all together and is really deeply baked into the system design, you should consider faking a real clock in your model. If you care about uh, those clocks being different, put a bound on the clock drift <coughs> and definitely consider giving executable, model, uh, executable models to your customers. And finally, um, Hillel Wayne, I owe you Everything. Thank you. <laughs> That's all. Okay, thanks. Questions?
Just raise your hand, arm, don't be shy. Maybe I missed this. Was the customer asking you to show that there was drift? Did they, like, you said you had a heuristic idea that there was going to be drift there. Was it the job of you and your company to, to show that somehow? Or just in the nature of doing the other work, you were able to come back to them and say, hey, you've got a drift problem here? Part of our engagement with them was to do some formal analysis. Um, and this is what immediately jumped out. Is this the first time you're talking about this in public, like doing a write-up, any talk, anything? Um, about this, yes. Yeah, OK, because it's an interesting thing. It's like a really interesting technique you use to sort of model the clock drift in the um, app, right? Would you be interested in sort of doing, like, maybe collaborating on a write-up on that, like what you did, the patterns? I think the more we can sort of talk about these techniques, the more accessible we can make this to other people. Um, yes, the chief of marketing at our company will be very happy. <laughs> Um, so how much work was sort of modeling what this company was specifically doing? So I, I mean, I can imagine that it wouldn't really result in anything useful unless you actually model what they're kind of roughly doing as well. Um, it was, I guess, medium as far as TLA plus work goes. I think the final spec was in the 10 page kind of range. Um, it, Modeling their system, uh, once we had established the, the technique of dealing with the clocks, was fairly straightforward. Um, because the information part of their algorithms were really based on the, the parameter of what time is it. Uh, I guess I have a question. Does it have sparked interest in this company in adopting TLA Plus by those electrical engineers? I'm, I'm sorry? Um, do you think that the electrical engineers will pick up TLA Plus as, because it has been proven to them useful? I don't know. Um, I don't have enough of a in, in, of, of window into uh, the rest of this uh, particular customer to know. Um, Part of the feedback we got from them is that they were using this as kind of a, a way to rally a, around model-based development. I suspect that they took the wrong message from this because in the electrical engineering community, model-based development means you will use something like Simulink and draw out a state machine that you want to have a program to deal with and that will generate C code for you, which will be, of course, better than writing the C code by hand but we would rather have some kind of analysis of the interaction with that state machine and everything else. Uh, so I, I really don't know. Mm -hmm. um, are you familiar with the work uh, of Intel using TLA Plus to design the chips? Uh, no, I haven't. I okay, that. that's something that happened 15, 20 years ago. Oh, maybe, maybe more on the 15 years side. But they used TLA Plus extensively um, to model check and then validate their designs. And I mean, okay. it's pretty close, right, from mm -hmm. the domain, problem domain. More questions? Well, then, thanks okay. again. Thank you.